Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today in the cyberspace for uh, uh, the first uh, event of Centuries uh, Speaker Series uh, 2022 uh, with uh, Cecilia Nicholson. Um, before I begin, um, Oh, my name is Henry. Uh, I'm the executive director and curator of Center A, Vancouver International Center for Contemporary Asian Art. Uh, before I begin, uh, I would like to acknowledge that Center A is situated on the unceded territories of uh, the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish uh, nations on which we create, learn, and live. Unceded means that this land was never re surrendered, relinquished, and, or handed over in any way. We recognize that the indigenous peoples who have been dispossessed from the homelands and territories upon which an institution was built and currently occupies and operates in. To acknowledge this traditional territory is to recognize the city and country's longer history predating confederation, one where indigenous peoples have lived since time immemorial. Located in Vancouver's Chinatown, Century also acknowledges and recognizes the complex and multi layer experiences of the individuals and communities who have lived, built, and contributed to the vibrancy of this historic neighborhood and those who continue to do so today. Um, and in conjunction with our uh, very exciting uh, arts writing, a mentorship program uh, that we just uh, spearheaded uh, this year at Center A. Um, we have uh, invited um, uh, a wonderful uh, lineup of uh, writers, um, uh, authors, poets, curators, um, and uh, artists to, uh, to share with us on their practices and also works. Uh, and today, uh, it's my a uh, great honor to um, uh, invite uh, Vancouver-based poet uh, Cecily Nicholson uh, to be uh, a guest speaker uh, for our arts writing cohort. And also um, uh, uh, the first part of the lecture will be open to a public followed by uh, a brief Q&A. Uh, so let me quickly uh, um, uh, do a shout out to the uh, the cohort of the arts writing mentorship uh, who are in the attendees list, and uh, let me introduce Cecily. Um, so Cecily is a poet and organizer. Her most recent book, Wei Sai Sung, won the Governor General's Award for English Language Poetry. Her forthcoming title, Howlings. Um, by Talon Books uh, in 2022 is a study in Black uh, ruralities and uh, Anuat uh, architectural, uh, sorry, my apologies, uh, agricultural and art histories. Cecily volunteers with community impact by um, casualty and food insecurity and works in education. She was the 2021 writer in residence for the University of Windsor. Um, and the second part of uh, today's uh, webinar uh, would also be opportunity for uh, the arts writing cohort to, uh, to chat and uh, speak to Cecily uh, as well. So without further ado, <laughs> I've, I feel like I've been speaking a lot. Uh, let's welcome Cecily. Henry, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really uh, appreciate the invitation. Um, Raquel, behind the scenes um, or in front of the scenes, I'm not sure um, what you all are seeing, but uh, I, appreciate, I appreciate the invitation. It's a unique opportunity. Um, and those of you all in the cohort um, joining us, I'm so pleased to make your acquaintance. Um, I uh, want to invite you. Um, the online platform for me is always um, somewhat dissociative. So if we meet in real life, um, I hope we get a chance to have, I think you have some end of the term kind of celebrations or a future moment. Um, please uh, let me know that we've connected here um, and help jar my memory um, because I'm, I'm, it's, it's a strange format this way. Um, I am joining you from a Kikite territory. This is um, the historical waterways and um, seasonal um, gathering places and land. Um, of the Kikite people, um, the Musqueam, as well as the Kwantlen and Keitsi people um, who have been um, using and um, in relation to this river that I am in sight of right now, uh, known by many as the Stolo. Um, and I am a temporary 
guest here um, with um, both decolonial, um, anti-colonial and um, anti-establishment, et cetera, um, intentions. Um, and um, part of the way in which I manifest that, I hope, um, is in my writing practice. So for today, um, what I thought I would, I would like to share um, as part of uh, generating a discussion is to think through the idea, um, the, my perspective maybe, um, a sense of, of reading or process um, and to host a discussion in relationship to the notion of archive. Um, now, of course, this is just gonna be a snapshot and I'm gonna be using my own practice and writing as, as an example. And I'm gonna refer you to um, a few stellar uh, poets in particular who I think are exemplary in terms of their relationship to it. But I'm sure you know, this is a, a deep field um, that moves across multiple disciplines. So there's lots of ways to think deeper on this topic. Um, I, I wanna apologize, it's leaf blowing season or I think they're blowing around the beautiful petals. So I'm hoping you can't hear that, but it's a little bit in my ear right now. So not much I can do about it. Um, so uh, you all, uh, I think had a chance to read an article um, that I wrote a few years back. I've just put the, the link um, in the chat for those of you who may not have had a chance uh, to read it. Um, I, you please, please do if you, if you feel so inclined. Um, it's a bit embarrassing because it's a, a fairly revealing um, piece for me. Um, I wanted to start there in a, for a couple of reasons. So um, the, um, the ways in which I, I, I want to talk about archive is, is to highlight the ways in which we can actually um, relate to it or affect it potentially, so not just simply be shaped by it. Um, and I, um, I touch on um, this idea necessarily across genre, so moving across form and across genre. So using prose, research and citations. So those of you who are in academic environments know uh, some of that practice, which is a deliberate practice. It's not just incidental, you have to learn how to do that. Um, and thinking through as well and ever um, poetics, narrative and storytelling. Um, I always thought of myself as a poet. And so I, I'm always quite surprised when I, I find myself veering off that path, um, often in a hybrid way. So writing in more than different more than one form, uh, potentially even at the same time. So the article I shared with you in Poetry Foundation, I think is a bit of an example of that. The piece was curated by a wonderful uh, Bay Area poet, Stephanie Young, and she had invited me to answer the question of the prompt um, to speak to one of the first instances in which I was paid um, to write poetry. Um, so generally um, the idea of being paid as a writer. Um, which we tend to associate with this idea of professionalism. Um, and in that approach to writing about it, I ended up having to move through um, my own situated history in terms of labor, um, how I actually grew to, I guess, value and um, want to establish myself in relationship to cultural production. I would never have used that language when I was younger, but, um, and, and it required me also moving through personal story, through fact, and to weave through sort of his, uh, the odd historical moment um, so that I could create a relevant present commentary. Um, and I found it extremely challenging. Um, and, but in the aftermath, it, it really did spark some things for me. Um, archive, of course, has official uh, definitions and characteristics, and they tend to be linked to um, disciplinary practices. They link to um, quite often to institutions. Um, in some cases, this may be the academic institution. Um, it may be um, a municipality. Um, we have provincial archives, federal archives, we have library, library archives. You know, there's any industry will have its own archives. There's, it is a, a nuanced and deep um, uh, wide practice. Um, but for many of us who relate to those forms in which curate the archives, so the institution, perhaps industry um, and um, uh, you know, academia, um, if we have a fraught relationship to any of those institutional spaces or those formal structures, potentially then we also have a fraught relationship to the archive. If we come from histories who are, have been systemically not recognized, documented, gathered and approached in um, non-racist or thoughtful ways, it's quite likely that how we are represented 
in an archive and by we now I'm talking personally, I would think of that as, um, you know, maybe family or ancestors or uh, cultural practice, um, um, you know, histories of migration, whatever it might be. Um, and then of course, um, all of our writing and, and creative practices, it, how those actually show up and are present in an archive for many of us um, is, is uh, um, potentially violently um, mitigated, um, potentially censored, not collected at all. Um, and um, quite often um, embedded in a normative structure um, of what the archive is supposed to be or do and represent. So as a, as a methodology, I suppose, um, I started to think about this idea of the archive and it came out of um, other impetuses as well, other writers and um, if, you, if you know Sadia Hartman's work, um, a very inspiring um, sort of notion um, that I begin my last book with, Wayside Saying, um, um, just her thinking about um, the absence of what it means to be, have the absence of an archive and what it means to um, then potentially need to create it. Um, it, it also was inspired by, um, I don't, a, a number of poets, um, but I think in particular, um, a quote from a, a, a friend of mine, Junie Desil, years ago, who talked about being greeted um, as, a, as somebody from the Caribbean or a body that's recognized as being Caribbean, which is my, is my experience, although I'm from rural Southwestern Ontario, multiply displaced through um, foster adoptive and other kinds of care um, and a rural background, very dissociative or sorry, displaced and, and dispossessed from uh, deep ancestral roots. But nonetheless, my, my legibility is my body is Caribbean. But being greeted as a Caribbean body, um, as being somebody, tout vient de passage, um, are you, are you of the passage? Um, so the middle passage, of course, immediately comes to mind. So what it means to be Black diaspora from um, African routes coming from um, a continental history that's, that's a, a world away um, and all that is lost or um, the depth of, of loss that is, exists actually in bodies of water, um, the bottom of an ocean. Um, that could be our ancestors, that can be our historical documents, our cherished items, um, our memory, um, and other ways to think of it. But it was it was uh, an earlier earlier thought that really inspired me. So for um, my book from the Poplars, um, I uh, I entered into a deep study. Um, I tried to interact with um, formal archives, so the provincial archive, the municipal archive. Um, I uh, connected locally in terms of Indigenous uh, nation and community uh, for which there wasn't necessarily a um, publicly accessible archive. I connected to uh, storytellers and people who held uh, knowledge in their bodies from the land. And I started to weave in my own practice, my own approach to being out on the land. Um, I took inspiration from the writings of Sarah Hunt. Um, and speaking of Sarah Hunt, who had at the time talked about the city beneath the, 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 um, or the land beneath the city, rather, um, and many others. I mean, um, the different um, elements of pedagogy that are manifest in Leanne Simpson's work, for example, is um, in, impossible to not engage in at this time. Um, so thinking through what my own uh, presence here meant, what I was doing physically with my body, what I was observing with my multiple senses, and how that could interact and interlay um, with this other formal archive. Um, and to uh, the result of creating a book, um, and it, uh, through the object of the island, um, working through scale and time, um, and creating uh, what I hoped was a dense um, archival poetics. Another point of inspiration, um, you know, as I'm saying, there's so many writers and um, people who um, are who, who engage archive in these very deft and um, counter narrative ways, um, just just moving with such skill. Um, a, a really obvious example for me is uh, Jordan Abel's work, um, and um, we had a, a chance to to engage in an interview. Um, a little while ago, um, I'll just I'll, I'll tuck the the link to that in um, the chat as well. Watch my adept chat inserting technology skills here. Woot, woot. Okay, um, and uh, you know, and so uh, let me not put words into to Jordan's mouth in terms of this topic. 
please take a look. Um, and he, he talks about it in other places as well. Um, but yeah, in conversation with Jordan, we talked about the archive, its official uh, definitions and characteristics, the ways in which it tends to be linked to discipline and practice. Um, but we also thought through um, um, in, the, in the framework of intergenerational trauma and accountability, um, the ways in which uh, overall the archive is advantage is potentially not accessible, has been erased, is illegible, and has, in, has been framed in ways that are violent or insult, insulting or never formed in, in the first place at all. Um, and then we, we bridge to this conversation around the personal archive, which is just a descriptive form. It's a very literal um, stand-in um, for what we were talking about. So the documents, interviews potentially, public talks, um, family correspondence, court documents, other elements of, of our lives that actually interweave uh, with institutional frameworks and bodies, maybe our collected documents that exist in other forms. But when we gather those along with our own, um, um, you know, per, as I'm saying, sharing that sort of methodology, our own perspectives and work at documenting and, and trying to um, um, legitimize and, and share our own perspectives, um, that we develop potentially these very rich projects. Um, so Jordan's work um, in his most recent work, uh, Nishka, um, is a must uh, view, read. Um, another person who is a stellar uh, example, I think, of moving through prose, poetics, and archive is uh, my gal Mercedes Zing. Um, you know, I think of her as a sister poet. Um, and um, you just can't read through her work without really being floored by the ways in which um, when we situate ourselves as counter narrative or narrative in the context of archive, how powerfully um, we can undermine or um, uh, diminish or shift potentially the meaning of both the archive, but also of those institutions. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's more to be said about uh, so many other writers, another uh, person in recent memory that I've um, had a chance to work with um, in such a privileged way is uh, David Bradford, um, whose recent book um, has uh, just uh, been nominated for the Griffin, uh, but in, again, engages his own uh, recollections, his own family history, and situates it systemically through time, space, and scale, economy, and so on, to create this powerful um, moment that does not exist until you write it. Um, yeah, so um, the second part of what I put my notes away, like I'm not going to need them. Um, the second part of what I, I'd like to, to, uh, to do today is just share a little excerpt um, from my current work in progress. Um, and it's, um, it's actually quite along the way in progress in the sense that I'm in copy edits. So it's almost in, in the real life, which is terrifying. Um, those of you who've published things, you know, right, there's always this little minute where you let things go. Um, and that's something that maybe we, we can chat about as a group, but is the ways in which um, when the vulnerability of sharing uh, personal, uh, what we might understand as personal experience or um, information, um, as information and as public document. There's a risk to that. There's a uh, potentially a trauma or re-traumatizing. There's uh, other uh, authors who have talked about this, but it's, um, it is something to um, take special care um, and cho choose carefully um, because the other aspect of, of interrupting, um, you know, dominant normative narratives with our, 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 sh our perspectives and, and these, you know, potentially rich and and emotive uh, engagements is that you, you, that work will be consumed. Um, and not everybody consumes in the same way. So um, um, sometimes, um, and I would say this in the context of white supremacy, so not necessarily inherently of white people or culture or whatever uh, that might mean, um, which is probably an interlay of, of class and other privileges, but in the context of white supremacy, um, the consumption of trauma, um, particularly violence on black bodies is something I'm very uh, uh, aware and attuned to, um, is voracious. So there is a desire, not even, uh, not even unconscious, um, um, desire to consume uh, violence um, and um, trauma is an, is an element of that, right? So um, that's a side note and maybe a longer conversation, but. Um, what are the implications of sharing our personal stories? Um, 
by the way, you may hear me sidestepping um, really obvious many examples um, of the memoir. Um, so of course, um, you know, um, that is a historical uh, practice of, of sharing personal stories often situated within space and time that reveals much about the context um, in terms of, of, again, economy, politics, and, and so on. Um, I, I think I'm differentiating a little bit from that genre because um, setting out to write um, a poetic text or the, the poetic text that I've um, shared examples of, they're not necessarily specifically just autobiographical. There's definitely an intent um, that moves beyond that. Um, just to, in, in, to reference my own writing, which feels always weird, but my uh, most recent um, published book, Wayside Sang, um, I set out to try to uh, relate to, and I would say uncover, but I didn't uncover a lot more than I already knew in a certain way, um, but a history or a narrative related to my birth father, who I did not grow up with, um, but I knew a tiny little bit about. Um, and um, I did that by trying to retrace um, the historical patterns of migration that he was a part of, um, which related to the automobile industry and concordant industries. So um, by way of engaging, being on the road, being in a car, the ways we relate to the industry, the way it relates to a fossil fuel psyche um, is one of the terms that I use, the ways it connects to um, deep uh, senses of when you're from the rural uh, to notions of liberation um, and, um, and capacity to be mobile and movement and, and all of these things manifest in that and in, in, in analogy, um, extended and deep, I hope, analogy, um, um, but in a way that also was uh, giving a substance to a sense of, of um, again, what I would understand is um, a personal archive or history, um, but it wasn't fully memoir. So in the sense that uh, this is not a narrative, it doesn't start out at one place in a linear fashion. It doesn't have the characteristics of the overarching sort of characteristics of story development that you might look at. How, how do you write a memoir? So um, um, I, I bring that up, but just, it's a side note and I'm happy to talk more about it, but I wanna make clear that what I do is as yet um, is, not, is not memoir writing. Anyway, I keep talking myself out of reading, so I'm going to just share a little piece, and I realize the excerpt that I've chosen isn't super hyper-personal or necessarily um, archival in the, in the ways that um, it's actually archival as I'm citing archives, so um, it may or may not be applicable, but it is uh, an intro uh, to the text, and the text itself, um, I use these broader archival moments to connect to my personal stories of living on a farm and uh, my current uh, practice of volunteering on a farm. So those are sort of the three parts that are, are, um, I attempt to weave through. So let me start. Carver, an excerpt from Harrowings. Places my hand on the relief cast of Carver, George Washington Carver. The cast is cool. Hand vibrates to feel the whole surface at once, memory and indent sense of prints, extent charged tips through index and middle metal carpels. It was a passing shadow of a bird at rest, my hand settling on Hathaway's sculpture. Associatory, simple elements, the store of atmosphere, pounds of water brought this property to situate within genealogy, giving backs to land as intellectual and art history. Idle moments put to gather, to care, to share food, to not succumb to the logics of land, crop, harvest as required by institutions of slavery or capitalism. The country wears a rich and luxuriant aspect says Frederick Douglass for the 1st of August celebration at Dawn Settlement, Canada West, 1854. In 1854, Frederick Douglass set out from Rochester, New York to attend a gathering to mark the 20 year anniversary of the West India emancipation, in quotes. The 1st of August celebration at Dawn Settlement for fugitive slaves, he traveled um, most of the 300 mile journey by rail, except, except for 16 miles between Chatham 
and the settlement referred to um, the first of, um, or the Dawn settlement, um, which he traveled to by wagon. Douglas journeyed through traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, Mississauga, Attawandaran, Anishinaabe, and Mayamiya nations to arrive at the historic, quote unquote, so-called county of, quote unquote, so-called uh, Kent. My quote unquote, so-called are in quotations. About that 1854 journey, Douglas remarks, in regard to the place itself, it is one of the most beautiful and desirable locations for agriculture, commerce, and education, which we know of in Canada West. I reflect further on fugitivity of that time and upon life in the near aftermath of slavery as the dominion of Canada formed. The language and optics or logics of the farm stem from structures of settler colonialism, even as they involve emancipatory practices, certainly in that case. And this has made for complicated dreams. Sufficiently free from the fatigue of this journey, rounding a corner to the song of a lark, a painting, Breton. the light was so familiar, I had to sit. For many voices, starts, a moth, a lit, a rhetorical Du Bois, faltering inches of progress, the dawn, as the sundial says to the soil, your auntie up the road just now recalls. To drop quietly in what may be considered no velvet road. Sun slow reaches by wagon over tracks, the soil losing time and time again to corn. History as decomposition. Tillage, machinery is entangled the surface, aerobic stems from roots and microflora and bacteria, fields against nature, the natural anchored in rot, pasturage, planting, regeneration, plots to pick rocks in tandem with machines. My first job was walking in formation. A child, field hand, searching for small rocks, frost, frost heaved to the surface. Uncompetitive roots at varied depths of soil nutrients under restorative cover. Leaf tansy resists the eager and unproductive seedlings, thugs invasive and exotic, sweet smelling dandelion, it's yellow, a monarch in milkweed. Burdock tea keeps meaning to steep ovum leaves from youthful branches, clover, mustard, and winter rye, flowering tells, sun, the morning hours. Soil clung to grasses, sweet, switch in June, reserves of cultivated squares. The runoff slide of swill, the ditches order placed around holds as farmstead stamps in a bird's eye. Willow, Acadia of the endless plains, an act of literature, my lion and tiger, my August morning, all hours, wound, all hours are the same. Soft pearl, the streams, the birds renew their notes. Near dry creek folds a cabin collapse and cellarless on the ground. The tempers dim, breathing through the nose, shoulders bare, cooling back. Amid a chorus of whirs, grasses shake and curl, the sweet and pounceable body, I can feel my place in extraction and hear how to center, how hard to decenter, discourse that's found me determined. Arriving, evening stars include Venus, casting shadows on a dark firmament. Happenings are a place where is inevitable material, a practical claim required for associative rain or shine. All discourse is placed and the heart has its reasons, says Stuart Hall. Close smiles soften together, simple lean in undemand and sturdy, just passed, just buried, burning anew, visiting, fresh, and bright as I was dreamed. Um, I think I'll leave that piece right there, but um, yeah, um, I realized as I was reading that the another aspect of it's not archive, it's just uh, research um, is um, 
in modes of, of scientific study. So I spend a fair bit of effort um, in all of my work thinking through um, uh, deep time, geological time, thinking through um, ecology, biome, relationships to um, interrelationships with other species, um, and um, just rhythms of the world that have nothing to do or will continue on uh, regardless of uh, human presence. Um, but um, I try not to talk about that in, in uh, flightful ways or um, you know, ungrounded ways. I try to, try to uh, spend a fair bit of time researching and learning um, as I go. Um, yeah, okay. So <laughs> there's always this point with a webinar, which is you, your head, there's nobody, I know you're all there. <laughs> so maybe I can uh, invite everybody back. Um, hopefully I said something that generated any sort of ideas or thoughts. And I'd, I'd love to, um, you know, if there's immediate questions, and then I know we're going to break and kind of, um, but I think we're kind of the whole group here um, to go on to the second part to talk. I'd love to talk a little bit more um, about what you're up to. So Henry, over to you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Cecily. I think that um... Thanks so much for the, the the sharing, the the reading. I uh, I I just I look forward to uh, reading the the entire book and um, I'll send uh, it we, to you for sure. Uh, thanks so much. And um, uh, I think that uh, what you have uh, mentioned about uh, uh, archives and also um, uh, this uh, kind of personal journeys, I would say. Um, and some of these aspects are really um, uh, some of the, I would say, very uh, important explorations and also, uh, I would say, kind of behind the arts writing mentorship as well, uh, that program in terms of how we address those through writing practice and also uh, um, uh, uh, through the lens of art and how those uh, ideas are, uh, are uh, explained and also um, uh, extended in those ways. Um, and um, but before we're going to the smaller session, uh, we do have some questions from um, um, Diane, who's actually <laughs> also our programming coordinator at Center A. Um, uh, perhaps we could start with those questions. Um, sure. Uh, from a Q and A. Um, so Diane asks, uh, what are some ways we can create a caring space to share these knowledge and experiences that are sometimes uh, personal or uh, traumatic? Mm -hmm. um, uh, perhaps I'll expand on that a little. I think Diane, uh, you are uh, asking, um, uh, you know, uh, the. Um, uh, the experiences and uh, human emotions uh, that they can be traumatic. Uh, but when we're in a space that we are caring for each other, how um, perhaps how to careful, how to uh, to address them, uh, 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 but also not repeating uh, uh, the trauma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. And and uh, earlier, where I was um, just chatting about how how important it is to to take care when we're we're sharing and being really intentional about that. Um, that's part of what I was getting at. Um, it's just re you know knowing and learning, and many of us have found out the hard way um, that it's it you know you want to share and you want to move something forward as an idea, uh, but there's potentially a risk and a vulnerability to that. So um, one of the things I would say first off is like a gathering like this that you all have formed is a really wonderful place to start. Um, but if not this space, if you don't have this space, then to form that space. Um, I don't believe that most writers um, effectively work without some element of community. It may be a small peer group. Um, maybe some of us, you know, some people are more extra extroverted um, and not me, but, um, you know, uh, I've been a, a part of writing collectives. I've been a part of uh, just small community groups going to readings or spaces where I know. I know that it's going to be an accessible space for me and my needs, and it's going to be an accessible space um, and for people in relation to me as well. So it's not just us that experience trauma sometimes when we're, as we know, when we're saying trauma, um, it's the whole sort of idea behind triggering um, and trying to know triggers um, is that we can, can never be quite sure how we're affecting others' um, emotions. I think, unfortunately, with PTSD, you know, you can uh, trigger that. I, personally, I would let you know you can trigger that from a whole range of things that aren't so direct. So it's, it's, a, it's a hard thing to, to navigate. 
Um, but yeah, I think starting small. And uh, I will tell you that I've only been a public writer for about 10 years now, um, a little bit more than that. I think my first publication uh, formally was, um, it's in this article, I think it's like 2009 or something like that. Um, so it's more than that now, I guess, and here we are in 2022. So 13 years as a publicly, a public writer. I've been a writer since I was a kid. I've been a writer long before I even knew what poetry was, you know, like as a little kid. So um, it's not that I don't have a lifetime of writing about trauma. Um, I really had to figure out how to do that and to find a place to do that where I was, was still standing after. The other thing to remember is that, um, so yeah, so in a small group sharing material, if it feels you know, you want to venture out and try uh, and enter into more meaning because you're moving off a journalistic, you know, there's nothing wrong with writing in your journal and keeping notes to yourself, but you want to move off from that and kind of enter into relationship with your art between you. Um, and so start to practice that. Absolutely. It's like everything. I mean, practice, sadly, is just one of those things that we all have to do for whatever it is. If it's speaking, if it's reading, writing, it doesn't matter. Practice, practice. Um, so we practice sharing trauma. Okay. Why not? And um, and so thinking about that, and then and then ex doing it in small elements, and then allowing space and time for feedback. Um, and you know, if you're if you're going to share, you know, step up to a public mic for the first time, bring a friend, let them know. Like I'm going to share this piece. I'm really not sure how it's going to go. Can you support me? <laughs> um, I've totally had to go to a friend after in the context of a reading and be like, I just feel like such a dummy for sharing that. It was really hard. Um, and of course, your best buddy or whoever is going to be there to take help take care of you. Sometimes we need help. Um, so those are some some strategies. Um, I think it's also just remembering that um, you know, even if you've written something down, like my first book is just so full of post trauma stuff. It was very immediate for me after a, re a recent assault when I published that book. There's lots of grief. There's lots happening. So when I read from that book, it's been over 10 years, but I still have these moments where suddenly the words and the emotion attach and I look up and there's like 20 people in the room or whatever it is, you know, or you're online and it's recording or like, um, and, uh, and you feel this thing that you don't actually want to share. You just want to share the words. So, um, so to remember that that actually can stay with you um, with what you publish and so that that care that you build around yourself, you probably need to maintain it. Um, in the meantime, writing isn't necessarily fully therapy. So if we have trauma, let's find other means of, of working on that. And so um, that's the, you know, beautiful practices of, of talking, or counseling, or therapy, whatever makes sense and works for you. It could be medical care. It could be a physical practice. It could be meditation. Um, it'd be curing and working on healing what's maybe wrong, um, reforming relations. So um, you can do all of that work too. Um, and I, I tell you that um, stabilizing and strengthening your core sort of sense of self is a really key um, aspect of being um, a strong artist and writer. I'm, I'm confident and just people in general. It's great to, to feel strong and confident in yourself when you're out there. So anyway, I could ramble on. Care is important. Um, and it's a big part of what I value, frankly, and what is really quite often missing. So yes, we have to build that. It's a really hard question I saw come up while I was chatting there, I think. But you you go ahead. Reframe Thank it. Thank you. Me. I think I think Rishal has a question uh, mm -hmm. first. Of course, yeah. Diane. Thanks for the uh, for answering Diane's question. Mm. Yeah, I think um, maybe just to follow up, um, thank you again, Cecily, for sharing and for reading out of your text. Um, I, yeah, personally, I thought that was really meaningful for me. And um, also reading the, the essay that you shared, um, there was a part where I think you wrote that it like took you like three decades to like get to that point in terms of like um, actually publicizing your writing. Cause exactly like you said, you've been writing like since you're little or like a little kid. And so I, yeah, I feel like I can really resonate with that in terms of this this writing for for oneself for for like a really long time and um you know even now I, I'm like hesitant to like put put work out there and into the public and also decide like who who gets to read something so so personal and so I was wondering um because you mentioned that earlier about really needing to choose carefully about um what you share and I was wondering um how that like how you navigate that process in terms of writing for for yourself in like a cathartic way or um you know writing 
that, that isn't meant to be seen by, by anyone versus something that will be read by others? And are there questions you ask yourself before going into that process? Um, especially like when you're maybe sharing about other family members or other people. And that's something, yeah, I'm, I'm curious about for myself too. Yeah, lots in there. Thanks so much for the question, Nicole. It's a good one. And I, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll touch on the um, question around family at the end, because it's really, really important, I think. So uh, just from my own personal perspective, so um, often when I'm writing, um, at something or I'm trying to get to the, the bottom of something or the, the point of something, um, what I'm writing is like this piece and then what I end up publishing is this little piece of that. So there is in the process of writing, which I do find cathartic as you describe and, and some, it relates to, um, I think of it sometimes as like when I publish a book is so exciting for me in a certain way, not because it's going out in the world, but because it's not in here anymore. Um, and that's helpful for me because I can start to think about some new things, but, um, and my memory can let it go because now it's on paper. Um, but, uh, yeah, and so I don't necessarily, um, I do process a lot in that, but I don't publish a lot of what I'm actually processing. So there's that. Um, the other thing is that, um, I, I should be, uh, perhaps clearer about my intentions or purpose in writing. I'm, I, I try to weave in my own personal narratives uh, a, when I'm invited to, um, which is a really valuable um, um, invitation. Um, and this is an example of that. I feel like like what I'm being invited to do is to share my perspectives. But quite often, that's not necessarily the invitation. And it isn't always in service to the what I'd like the work to do. So um, I'm very uh, concerned or uh, hypervigilant about the I, um, formal I, um, and speaking from my individual, you know, unless it's working for a greater sort of purpose in the, the book overall, or the project or the assignment or the project and, uh, or the dialogue and so on. So um, yeah, so I'm, I, I think um, the choices I make tend to have to do with that. Like, so I'm setting out to try to dismantle a sense of um, being embedded in, in fossil fuels and, and a sense of inherent liberation that's, that's tied to this you know, path towards extinction. Um, I'm like, okay, so I'm obviously relevant in terms of what I'm sharing, but what I'm trying to build there is a really is a much more complex picture, I hope. And so building, you know, as I say, through analogy of industry and automobile and roadways and movement and, and um, you know, indigenous sovereignty and, and the, the um, violence that we're, you know, our, our, our grids do in terms of land and so on. So it's just, it's, it's very quickly has to be um, involved in multiple topics. Um, there's few people who pull off, and that's the memoir. The memoir you sit down to write, so like read about somebody that's cool, uh, biography, autobiography, um, you know, thinly veiled uh, fiction, I guess. Um, but um, but generally speaking, I'm not trying to do that. So um, so I wouldn't want to speak to those examples. That'd be somebody else's expertise. But um, but yeah, for myself, I'm I'm um, uh, the choice is, is more about the project overall and does it suit those goals. Um, and there are times. This recent book, I had to pull out some poems because they were about direct violence that I experienced. I thought they were relevant, but as I read them and I had other people read them, I could tell that what they did was just really make people feel sad for me, um, which is not, you know, I mean, it's not terrible. I appreciate it, but it's not, I, I don't need that. Um, and I didn't think it was in purpose or in, in service to what the goal of that project was. So I want people to understand extreme racism and the ways that manifested maybe in a family unit or education and other things, but I don't, necessarily need to deal with blunt force trauma. So um, yeah, so there's like, you know, choices there. The last thing, but going back, circling back to family, for example, um, but it could be your chosen family, it could be your friends, it could be your teacher, it could be anybody that you're in relationship to, and what is your accountability to sharing their stories? That is a whole conversation in and of itself. I'm absolutely not going to um, land on an authority and say you should do this or you should do that. It's not prescriptive. It's absolutely relational and it will adapt and shift relative to each situation. So you need to feel it out. But I do, I do think it's really important to think like, first of all, um, does this person know this? Um, should they know it? Sometimes this, this, this relationships are broken to a point that they, we can't rebuild and we can't bring this, you know, like story of, of, um, queer love back to our hyper 
homophobic family or you know there's exa many many examples that's a violence to our story or to our text for example so there, there's just so many ways I can think about when we can't necessarily bring the stories back um, but in those instances thinking through carefully and gently um, is it necessary necessary necessity is a, is a, um, a good marker for me um, am I treating it with care and respect even if, if I'm angry or I'm, I'm hurt but can I approach this in, in a way that seems fair get your second and third readers um, you're opening it up to a public anyway so get ready um, and but if you have those relationships in place and you can take that literature uh, that you've created back to that Often if I'm sharing writing with people, honestly, that, that are in, you know, in some degree in my work, um, and I do, that I uh, make a point of that, they're all like, oh, it's this poetry stuff. <laughs> like they don't, they don't read poetry, <laughs> they, you know, and they're just like, I kind of get it. Um, so it's always like this sort of ambi ambivalent or ambiguous thing with poetry because the nature of poetics is a degree of opacity if we're lucky um, while we're pulling through some other kinds of resonance and meaning. So um, I strive to it. I, I hope it happens when I write. So it's not always translatable, but at least you share it in advance. There's a, um, a respect. Um, there's an intentionality. And think about it. If you are doing research and you think of it that way, what would you do if you, in, in an ethical framework if it was research? Of course, you're going to find a way for your participant to somehow engage with this text and make sure they're okay and somehow return that work to them with a degree of accountability and follow through. And not just like in the moment when you go to publish, but what does that look like 10 years from now and so on. So, yeah, it's that part is such a, an important concern. Um, and uh, yeah, subjective answer, I guess. But. Thank you so much for speaking on that and the accountability and um, the considerations of, of your relationships with people. I think, yeah, it, mm -hmm. that's super important. And so, yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. It helps a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are definitely some of the, um, uh, some of the important uh, topics to think about, like the subjects to think about. I think I always think about well, you know, um, uh, when we um, talk about, let's say, other stories, how uh, no matter how close they are with uh, mm -hmm. uh, ourselves, uh, there is that uh, also responsibility to to um, um, to I get maybe not check, fact check. That sounds very journalism, but uh, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. but yes, uh, but to to also be transparent and then also to um, uh, uh, in a way to to honor it to give it the uh, the most honest lights and um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, to talk about those um, and uh, yeah Rishal that's I think that's a wonderful uh, question as well because I think uh, these are um, important to uh, talk about um, mm -hmm. I was wondering if there's any other questions from well could I Oh, sorry, I just, there is a really long uh, question in the chat. And I'm not sure if that's a participant or if that's a guest. Um, and I, I don't, it's, too, it's, it's a lot to answer um, and I have a very long answer. So what I'd, I'd love to just touch on it briefly. Um, if it is a participant, I'm happy to chat with you more about it. Um, but the gist of it is sort of um, speaking to what does it mean, for example, to win a governor general's award, um, uh, which is a, you know, profoundly, you know, it's the, the, the arm of the federal government. It is, has the governor generals, um, the, um, the official representation of the queen. It's a profoundly colonial um, name. Um, and so the, the nuance of the question is, um, as an anti-establishment artist, how do you reconcile these nuanced contradictions within our Canadian art and publishing ecosystem? So um, I just wanted to say to the, the um, person, um, Tapari, I hope I'm saying your name right, um, you don't. Um, uh, there's, uh, for me, there's absolutely no reconciliation. It's very uh, um, uncomfortable. Um, and um, it started for me actually when I uh, won the BC Book Prize. Um, I recall um, going to the award ceremony and everybody stood to toast the queen. Um, and I remember, um, uh, great, so probably let's chat more after this. Um, but I remember sitting there and looking around me and like, the fuck, and, you know, and I didn't think I was gonna win that. So I wasn't even worried about that at that time. I was just so terrified, um, just generally. Um, and then I won and then I, you know, I was like, okay. Um, and then I got up and did my speech that I, you know, was doing my best to undermine and counter the moment and speak to the absence, you know, historically, which has shifted in recent memory, but at the time was very, very unclear. Um, 
Governor General Ward, similar thing. I spoke directly to my family um, and found family in the room. It was a very, very hard space, a difficult space. Um, so yeah, and I thought a lot about what it would mean to turn down these awards. Um, and um, financially, I actually, I just didn't feel like I could. Um, I have lifetime student debt. I had, um, had, I just came out of debt like a couple of years ago in part because of um, I'm still kind of working my way at um, regaining my life, but I'm approaching 50 and I will have never owned property. I, you know, so there, uh, you know, for coming from a lifetime of, of poverty, there's definitely a tension there to saying no to award dollars. Um, it's not like something that you go out and you try to get, or I mean, personally, um, I don't write and be like, I hope this is a word winner. It's so weird. Um, but, uh, but it's very difficult. And um, much of the publishing industry um, um, does uh, in, uh, require us to uh, represent ourselves in certain ways, not just colonial, but are also capitalist. Um, so um, I do think it's really important to work on integrity. And the, one of the ways I do that is I always situate myself in relationship it's construction, I don't know if you can hear that, it's the worst, um, in community. So I always um, bring my work back. I am always giving my time um, as best I can. It's what I, most valuable thing I have to give um, and, um, and always answering to my most frontline and my most righteous, um, badass um, um, organizing community and friends um, who will hold me to account. So. Those are some of the strategies, but there's really no, there's no reconciling that. I don't even like the word, you know, but yeah. So anyway, sorry for the side note, but yeah, Pari, let's, let's chat more about it. One, the bottom line is why do you write? Um, keep writing towards why you, why you write and make those purposes not about the state, not about your individual gain. And, and uh, I think you're on the right path. Thank you so much, Cecily. And thanks, Perry, for the, uh, the questions.